linear regression. Do you have intuition to share about linear regression? Or would you like to learn along with me about linear regression as a seeker of wisdom? I asked John Harland to teach me linear regression from his perspective. John and I met as PhD students in math at the University of California at San Diego in 1986. He teaches math at the Palomar College in San Marcos, California, including several courses in statistics. He participates at the Math for Wisdom discussion group. His deepest value is the experience of life, and he wonders, is there a way to formulate the laws of physics uh, so that uh, they evolve from a simpler, uh, from simpler concepts. I am Andrus Kulikauskas. I host Math for Wisdom, where I work with others to uncover wondrous wisdom, a language of cognitive frameworks, and express that in the language of advanced mathematics. Recently, I learned about the generalized linear model, which is a generalization of ordinary linear regression, and mirrors uh, and includes uh, the natural exponential families of quadratic variance functions, which mirror the fivefold classification of orthogonal Schaeffer polynomials, which may well express the five sum a cognitive framework for decision-making by which every effect has had its cause, but not every cause has had its effects. So there's a critical point for deciding. In order to understand the generalized linear model, I should first understand linear regression. As a physics student, I learned the method of least squares, which is used to calculate a line that best fits a set of data points in an xy plane, where we minimize the sum of the squares of the vertical distance from the data points to the best fitting line, which is the regression line. I suppose that this is the heart of linear regression, although other norms may be used for best fit, not necessarily least squares. In tutoring me, John keeps returning to the question, on what basis can we say that least squareds yields the best estimation? That's a question we don't answer in this video, but hopefully will in a future video, perhaps with your help. I welcome your comments below and invite you to contact me. I recorded two sessions with John. I have reorganized the material so that you can start with the key ideas sooner. In this first excerpt, I'm trying to restate one of the main ideas that he taught me. John has written down a formula for the slope k of the regression line, y equals kx plus b, which models the expected value of the conditional probability of y given x. According to this formula, as n goes to infinity, the slope k approaches sigma xy over sigma x quantity squared, which is the covariance over the square of the variance of x. Uh, and then, uh, then my last question or point was about the k. Like, so the whole point of this kind of was the k, I think. And the idea was that, uh, so theoretically, like k relates uh, the sigma xy. Like, so I think basically, like, this is my understanding, and you can correct me. But uh, it, it, theoretically, it's straightforward to have the sigma x, and it's straightforward to have the sigma y. That's kind of like, you know, assu it's assumed that you can do that. But the whole question is like, well, how do they depend on each other if they do? And then so this whole notion of the sigma x, y. And so theoretically, k is saying that you can calculate the sigma, k, you know, if you have the k, you can calculate the sigma x, y. So the question is, is, you know, uh, supposing you just have the data, can you get that k? And then that would give you the covariance matrix, and then you would know oh, like, yeah. exactly the relationship. This is the whole point. Is that Without right? Like what we're doing? 
without a doubt k k is an estimator okay. yeah k k you know the, the the formula is an estimator of that in other words as n goes to infinity it will converge to this and it and it, and it will converge to yeah. a smaller and smaller variance you know um and but what i what i don't know is why some other wacko uh formula that maybe is right. more complicated than this isn't even better and it could be that in certain contexts, probably Gaussian, it, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, my guess is a ga if the underlying distribution is Gaussian, this absolutely, you can't do any better than this. Here is how I've organized the material. First, John will give the big picture of his understanding that the real value of the regression line is the ability to predict how reliable it is. Next, I will share the insight uh, that I took away, uh, which John inspired me, which is to hypothesize an adjunction, as in category theory, by which linear regression relates a world of data sets with a world of linear relations. Going back and forth between these worlds uh, with this adjunction manifests four levels of knowledge, whether, what, how, why where reliability is why we use linear regression. Then we will proceed with the main part, where John explains to me linear regression from the point of view of a joint density function and estimating the terms in the covariance matrix. Finally, John and I have a discussion on cognitive frameworks, such as one all many, and on a game theory approach to making the best predictions and the meta-levels involved in such an analysis and an example of how optimization and morality diverge. So let's start with the big picture. You know, one, one of my hang-ups when, when I was doing the recording is that I'm not an ex expert in statistics. And, and so I was a little bit uncertain about the actual formulas that come out of regression, which is kind of a least squares algorithm, that is you're finding the line that uh, minimizes uh, the sum of the sum of the squares of the deviations in your y data from the line. And when you write down that algorithm, you get you know all the all the formulas for for regression come out of that come out of that minimization so that's that's mathematically clear but the question is so what you know what is you know what does that do for you one one way of thinking about it is that it's a maximum likelihood uh estimator of the slope and the y-intercept of the regression line so that's one you know so we could talk about my maximum likelihood estimation that maybe is an a priori justification of using least squares to find the regression line but i think that you know uh, that's from the point of view of probability theory why 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 say a mathematician who favors probability theory might then believe that there's some value in the regression line but i think that the really um the really uh convincing uh values of the regression line are after the fact if you use that algorithm the least squares algorithm and come up with those formulas then that regression line has some very nice statistical properties. I think that that's the real justification of the regression line. So no matter where it came from, least you know, maximum likelihood or whatever, I think that it's the properties of the regression line statistically that are the real value of of the regression line, and in particular the least squares algorithm and the formulas. So the statistical properties of the regression line, and, and my understanding is that you can then predict um basically how reliable that progression the regression line is the reliability of the, the the line based on how many data points you have and you know how they how much they cluster around the re regression line that's all quantifiable 
And I think in the end, basically what it does statistically is gives you error bar around the regression line. That if you use that regression line, given X, you use the regression, regression line to predict a Y, what is the reliability of that prediction in terms of inferential statistics? So there is a well-defined inferential statistics that is attached to that regression line. That I think is its real value. I was asking the mathematical question, is that the best possible mm -hmm. line that can go through that data? And I think that uh, depending on your metrics, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. You can define a metric in, in whatever mathematical way you want and define the best fit line in an in, in, in infinite number of ways. But I think that what, so it's almost after the fact, if you use the least squares, um, criterion for best fit line that you get these very nice statistical predictions and 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 in fact confidence intervals around the predictions that come from the least squares um, algorithm and I think that that's the real value of it so, so yeah so I found your explanation very helpful and I'll would likely use what you're saying now as the introduction, just in terms of the big picture, you know, why would I be interested in linear regression, how you think about it. But what it brings to mind for me and um, is that we have these different worlds that we're bridging between back and forth in the way that I think the junctions bridge worlds. So in category theory. And so there's, like four different worlds involved. And these would be like levels of knowledge of whether, what, how, why. So in the first case, the idea is that we suppose that in nature or wherever, there's some kind of relationships that are real. That just, you know, we may not know them, uh, but that somehow there is some kind of relationship. And from that world, uh, you go to the world of data. So you get like some kind of data that measurements that come out of that. That's just a different world, but it's reflected. So the data is the what, you know, like this, this reality that we don't actually access is some kind of weather, you know, like we believe that whether there is this uh, relationship, uh, hopefully or not, maybe it doesn't exist. But the idea is that the data is on this level of what in its measurement. And so it has the problems of sensory information and measurement that, you know, this, that's not, um, it's uh, got all these discrepancies, etc. But then what you do is then you take the data and using these mathematical methods of linear regression, you, you starting with the data, you create a model, a model that says, well, based on this data, the data that we have, what is the model that we think kind of adequately reflects the underlying reality? So it's not saying that it is the underlying reality, but it's saying like, this is based on the data that we have. This is what the best thing that we're able to come up with. But so that is a level of how, like, you know, how can we work with this? But then you take that model and then you pretend, so to speak, like, well, suppose how good would that model be with hypothetical new data, you see? And the point is, is that this model, it's not really applicable of itself, but the idea is that it's giving you like these way to kind of frame hypothetical data that you could possibly have. And you would, you know, in which case you would have these uh, reliability properties given by confidence intervals. So that's the whole level of why, you know, like, why are we interested in this, you know, whole knowledge issue? Like we want some control, we want some reliability, you know, we want to kind of like want some confidence, so to speak. And so you have these four very different uh, things. It's like a data world and a modeling world, and they're going back and forth. So like the original world is some kind of ideal model that we don't have access to in nature. Then you go over to the data world. Then you go back to the modeling world, but it's now like a human model of, well, how can we pick model this? And then you go back to the data world, but now it's like hypothetical data, like, you know, this data that doesn't actually exist, but but if if we did find it, you know, how would it? So it's a very nice example of like how a junction takes you back and forth between worlds. And what I'm trying to show about a junction is that it serves to structure in mathematically the divisions of everything. So like for knowledge, you need exactly these four perspectives. And so 
it just seems to be very much in that spirit. That's why I'm glad that you said this so that I could reply. That what I We're ready for John's mathematical exposition. But first, please uh, be alert. A couple of errors crept in. Uh, you'll see some corrections. Uh, just be aware. And uh, let's have uh, John give his general disclaimer. But he's really a genius. You know, I studied this for a part of a semester to be able mm -hmm. to teach, you know, basic statistics. Right. So, but I, I didn't really learn stats to my to my satisfaction like mm -hmm. uh, i you know there there's quite a quite a few things including regression that i feel like i sh I, I wish i i wish i understood better i wish i understood mm -hmm. it at a more fundamental level and so yeah i mean i looked at a few examples and that was kind of it and you know mm -hmm. you can you know that well, you, you know uh, more than me so elementary, I'm, elementary staff yeah, much more than me so i'm i'm uh, i appreciate yeah. you know and you have you have great intuition so yeah and now the main event john harland's exposition of linear regression you know i don't know the most general context for regression but it you know you have a if you have a point if you have a like a joint probability distribution um say random variables say big x and big y and you have a joint probability distribution p x y of x y just some sort of joint probability distribution density function So, you know, the density function has, you know, the the area underneath it mm -hmm. or the total total mass of the density function is equal to one, right? So um, you can ask, you know, uh, various questions about how these things vary with respect to one another. And one of the things you can ask is what is the probability of y what is the probability of getting y um, given a value of x mm -hmm. now i have to think about this i mean i should probably write this as y given x is that, those are the actual values. What's the probability of y given x? Now, it, this could be a nonlinear function. Um, in general, uh, for general distribution, um, mm -hmm. you might end up with a, you know, uh, you might end up with a, oh, no, 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 not the probability of y given x. I'm sorry. You can talk about the probability of the y, y given x and the expected value of y given x. I'm sorry. So the probability of y given x, that's just, you know, the probability, you know, that So it's just the joint probability over the probability hmm. of X and the probability of X, you know, the probability density function of X is just, you know, the marginal dis density functions P X mm -hmm. is just the integral over Y of P X Y. So you can, you can form marginal marginal distributions by just um, integrating out one of the variables mm. and so the expected value of y given x is just uh going to be 
Um, so what's that going to be? It's just going to be, yeah, you just integrate this. And this gives you some function of X. And in general, it could be, you know, expected value of Y given X. Could be, you know, just any curve in the plane. Mm -hmm. Right. But under various conditions, the expected value of Y given X is aligned. Mm hmm. And that's uh, a situation where it's appropriate to apply um, the statistical procedure of linear regression to try to figure out this function. Now, if this function is nonlinear, you could try to apply linear regression, I guess, I suppose, to small parts of it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't really know. I, I, haven't, I haven't done linear regression on, on a situation like that. For example, when px you know when the joint probability distribution is gaussian mm -hmm. that implies that this function the expected value of y given x is linear hmm. so that means that this looks like this um what is a Gaussian? Gaussian looks like uh, one That's over two pi uh, determinant of the covariance matrix, and then e to the negative one half, mm -hmm. and that covariance matrix in reverse. So the dot product, you know, it's like a have you seen this formula before? It's like a no, but uh, um, anyway, it's a it's a this is the general way of writing a joint Gaussian where this matrix here is the covariance matrix. Mm -hmm. For two variables. Right, for two variables. But it's you know, there's obvious generalizations for right. multiple variables. Same same formula. Um, it's just that covariance matrix is going to be n by n if you have n variables so this is a mm -hmm. two by two covariance matrix what is you know this this is just um i mean i don't know why i'm writing out all this detail but it's oh it's helpful thank you you know and then oh uh, i should I should mention uh, this is this is a zero mean. Uh, it, it probably is more interesting if you do a non-zero mean. So I should. Um, so you know, if for a non-zero mean for these random variables have a zero mean for non-zero. Mm -hmm. You have to replace those by x minus the mean of x. Y gets replaced by y minus the mean of y. So, mm. so yeah, I mean, it's just a, um, or the expected value of x, I should say. Um, maybe I should write it that way. That's my probabilist would write it. So mm -hmm. yeah, these may not be centered at at, at zero zero. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you know, obvious. So maybe what maybe I should write this out correctly. You know, if it's not centered at zero zero, you have to subtract off the mean, square it. And 
And so, the, so the covariance y minus c of y. Yeah, y minus so so um yeah so this is x minus e of x squared in the integrand. This is y minus e of y squared, and this really? is uh so you so you have to you have to center you have to basically center these variables around their mean uh to get the covariance. So So that's called the covariance matrix. Okay. And, um, and it turns out that in this case, E of Y given X is just equal to a certain constant KX where K is equal to, what is it? It's equal to the, That, that constant. Mm -hmm. hmm. And this can be written, uh, you can, it's maybe a little more vivid to write this as this is equal to the expected value of x minus ex squared. You know, this is, for example, the expected value mm -hmm. of x minus e x times y minus y e y. Right. Okay. So, so that's for that's for a joint. Um, that's for a joint Gaussian. Um, and the whole idea of, of Regression, I, I, I suppose, applies to more than just Gaussians. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of um, random variables are jointly distributed as a Gaussian because of the central limit theorem. So, you know, central limit theorem is kind of what allows you to do base, you know, the basic level of statistics. Um, you know, a lot of the hypothesis tests and everything are based on joint Gaussian distribution. So the, you're you're basically taking maybe non-Gaussian random variables, but then you're taking means of them. If you take a mean, mm -hmm. account, you know, if you take a sample mean um, of a non-Gaussian random variable, as long as your sample is big enough, usually they say threshold is something like 30, uh, that almost every uh, sample mean is going to be Gaussian. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, okay, so the way, so what, and what, so what that means is that the, no matter what the shape, but if there's enough numbers, then like, then it'll look Gaussian in the big picture. Well, as long as your random variables, as long as the random variables that you're choosing are, are, um, are like average you know like like uh sample means of mm -hmm. you know so um so for example if you're looking at oh say something like test scores mm -hmm. versus maybe uh, socioeconomic status and you average test scores over a, like a school and the socioeconomic status over a school and then you look at say test score versus socioeconomic status sampled over various schools mm -hmm. i believe that those would tend to have a joint gaussian because you're averaging like the several many students in the school like maybe hundreds of students in the school and you're averaging you know both their test scores and their social you know their mm -hmm. average and their income level. So I think you'd expect sort of a joint Gaussian distribution there. Um, if you looked at 
individual test scores within a school, maybe, uh, maybe you, I'm not sure you would expect, you, you would expect a distribution like that, but if you looked at like right. groups, groups of students and then compared groups of students, you know, groups of students, like maybe, you know, by grade level or by school or whatever. Um, so like in a, in a particular, um, like for a particular school, you know, you look at one score, you look at another school, like they may, um, the, 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 the typical distribution may be very particular, like it may be skewed in a certain way, you know, where there's, uh, uh, like in terms of test scores, uh, maybe there's uh, lots of uh, uh, high scores, but there's, uh, you know, but the low scores drift out or, you know, however it is, uh, it could have some kind of sh peculiar shape. Yes, but when you look at the means, and then you look at a bunch of different uh, schools, then the means will behave like a Gaussian. I believe so. I I always I always think this. You know, I mean, to me, my go-to distribution is always a Gaussian. That's where you learn. Mm -hmm. That's where you learn how to do your basic stats from a Gaussian distribution, and then there are more elaborate things you can do. Um, mm -hmm. And like, for example, if you divide. Uh, like if you square a Gaussian distribution, you know, if you square a random variable that's Gaussian, it's no longer Gaussian, it's chi-squared. Mm -hmm. You know, there, like there's certain combinations of random variables that you, that, that you do uh, that, that, that are, um, you know, certain functions of Gaussian ran, random variables are no longer Gaussian, but they're, they behave in a well-defined way. So, you know, there's more to statistics than just Gaussian, but the underlying assumption is always Gaussian, mm -hmm. uh, at least in basic statistics. Um, so if I'm going to learn like some phenomenon like this, like the, like, you know, that, um, you know, that the expected value of Y versus X tends to be linear, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to, you know, my go-to distribution is going to be Gaussian. Like I'm going to try to understand that from the point of view of a joint Gaussian distribution. And then once I understand it there, then perhaps uh, some of the some of the formalism generalizes um, to other kinds of distributions. Uh, but to me, the the basic insight comes from Gaussian, uh, at least on my level statistics. Anyway, that's why that's why I'm reaching for a Gaussian distribution here. So in a Gaussian distribution, you know everything is just very very straightforward. You know, like for example. Mm -hmm doing this covariance calculation, you can imagine that it's just a matter of doing, you know, like a, like this integral right here is, you know, you just um, take this distribution and you integrate this, you know, Y times this distribution, you integrate this over, over Y. And um, so you can, figure out that distribution and then you can i mean you can you can you can actually find the functional form you actually just mm -hmm. get this functional form right here mm -hmm. so it's everything is very straightforward everything can be computed exactly and you know you can understand formulas like this very easily i will interrupt with a clarification that john made afterwards that uh, uh, it should be kx plus b, because b could be non-zero. So, um, okay, so now here's where stats comes in. You know, the, um, what if you don't know, what if you, what if you know that your, your distribution should be Gaussian, but you don't know all these numbers in your covariance matrix? Mm-hmm. And perhaps you don't know your mean. So you take some sample points. So randomized samples. Means you're taking um, X1, Y1, X2, Y2. all the way down to X and Y N. So the way we think of the, about that in statistics is that these are 
identically distributed these are identically distributed uh random variables with a uh, joint probability density functions given above. Mm -hmm. So they all have the same joint density function given by this formula right here. And So identically so, distributed means that they're all coming from that space. They're all coming, yeah. Space. So the idea, the idea is that they would be all, you know, you're taking samples and they're and and they're they're um, they're independent. I should say independent. Mm -hmm. These are the yeah. IIDs, yeah. right? Like, right, I, IID, right. So very important in statistics. Um, sometimes that's not true in more advanced statistics. I guess you consider si situations where that's not true. Mm -hmm. But you know, in basic statistics, independent, identically distributed random variables. Mm -hmm. um, so what that means is that each sample you take um, is a particular, um, you know, is a particular uh, data value. Um, you're going to get, but that if you took another data value at some other time, you would get, um, you know, and, and a bunch of data values at other times, you would get uh, a histogram, uh, you know, an experimental, experimentally derived histogram that looks mm -hmm. more and more like your joint PDF. So in other words, uh, you're seeing, let's see, what, how does this go in stats? You, you say that the experimental distribution that you get from the data matches the theoretical distribution for the data. In other words, you're assuming the, you're assuming mm -hmm. the law of large numbers here, you know, for your samples. In other words, they're going to follow in, in terms of data, they're going to follow your distribution if you took a bunch of them. So um, it's it's like when you compute a mean, right? If you compute a mean uh, from a say a Gaussian distribution, um, I mean, if you compute just si single data points from a Gaussian distribution, take their mm -hmm. experimental mean, that's going to, going to converge to the to the theoretical mean. Uh, mm -hmm. via the law, law of large numbers. So mm -hmm. um, so the underlying assumption here is that when you take your data, it looks, you know, the histogram of it, uh, the, the, you know, for the larger the amount of data you take, the more that histogram looks like the underlying joint uh, probability de density function. So, um, and it is quite an assumption when you think about it. I mean, it, it, it really is the assumption that that glues the sort of the reality that the street level reality of stats mm -hmm. to the theoretical probability um, layer, and so that is the assumption. So what that means is that that um, so things like you know the if you take the mean of these mm -hmm. um, this is gaussian like a, you're summing up a bunch of gaussian and mm -hmm. this is gaussian with with um Variance equal with mean uh, mean equal to e of x, 
invariance equal to what is it one over i think it's one over n times the variance of x hmm. i think that's true and similarly ditto for one over n so what it means And I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. So what it means, for example, that um, these random variables, if you sum up these, you know, and take and take these, you know, means of these random variables, you know, and, and you know, take this algebraic combination, it home it homes in on a distribution that is uh, looks more and more like and how did I do that? I think I I think I I want to use consistent notation. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And so in particular, you know, one over N, this thing, minus, um, and I should call this, let's call this X bar, and this is Y bar. Mm-hmm. Okay, and this also um, goes to, and I'm not sure, and again, I'm sorry, I'm using N, capital N. I think, I think this goes to 1 over N, X, Y, I think. Mm -hmm. I got a little question mark there, but it, it, uh, but basically, these variances get smaller and smaller if you average these random variables. So, uh, mm. so what it means okay, that's no, this is true. Yes, sorry. Does uh, sigma anyway. xy mean sigma x times sigma y? No. No, it means it's a separate thing. It's no, separate... no, they're they're oh, joint. Oh, no, that's right. They're you're looking, they're, over. You're looking at their okay. joint variation. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad I asked that. Right, if, that's a joint. Okay. Yeah. No. If you're if these are if these are uh, independent random variables, that is true. Uh, if you think about this, if these are independent random variables, mm -hmm. um, that means that this factors. Uh, that means that the off diagonal independence means that the off diagonal stuff is zero. So. That means the X's and Y's don't mix, so you can factor that. And so sigma mm -hmm. X, sigma Y would be uh, zero because mm -hmm. you get you get X minus the expected value. The average of that is just zero. Um, okay, so, so that's that's if if if, if that uh, if P X comma Y in the probability dis density function, I guess if that factors right. Then, right. then they're independent. If it doesn't independent. factor, then they're not yeah. independent. And if for a Gaussian, what that means is these off diagonal terms are zero. And okay. so there's no mixing of X and Y. I see it breaks up into, into yeah. All right. Blocks. Okay. Thanks. So, so, so yeah, what I said at, at first that, that yes, it, it factors into uh, sigma x times sigma y. That's not true. It's it's equal to zero if they're. In and this is kind of so. I guess this is kind of like the whole point. We want to find this sigma x y. You know, it is. It's this the, is the whole point. The, this this yeah. is the whole point. Okay. How they're related. That's right. So, so we take a sample, mm -hmm. which is I'm going to write is x i star, you know, x one star. You know the the the. The notation in stats is always tricky to me. Like, are you talking about the random variable? Are you talking about 
the actual sample, you know, the the, mm -hmm. the the sample random variables, or are you talking about the actual sample points? So, and that's kind of related to this um, distinction you drew between the experimental data and then the theoretical model, right? Like the random variables would be part of the theoretical that's right. model. That's right. Then, so when we're talking about randomized samples, these are still random variables at this level. They're sort of still mm -hmm. theoretical. When you're talking about samples, you're talking about data that you that you actually take and mm -hmm. calculate. So sample data, it turns out that um, what you want to do is you want the best estimate. of of k in the expected value of y given x is equal to kx. And just to jump in like with my own thinking about this, but it's kind of like um, the sample data lives in its world. And in that world, you know, it's kind of like free to do whatever it wants, uh, but it has to be able to fake uh, uh, obeying the rules of the uh, theoretical world. So yeah, that's right. That's right. And it's like a Turing it, test kind of situation, like where yeah. you know, like oh, you know, who knows the logic of the sample data, but the sample data is somehow uh, required to pretend to be in, you know valid up to the theoretical um it model. is and, and basically the theoretical model doesn't really i mean it's the sample data that exists in the real world the theoretical model is a is an abstract model for mm -hmm. for um trying to understand certain things about that sample data and so it does not exist at all <laughs> in the real world it's the sample data does but well, and then there's a there could be like a disconnect. So like then the theoretical model simply could be the wrong model, uh, or oh, just yeah. not a helpful absolutely. model. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so time. so there's fact, this like parallel parallel existence, like where if it is a good model, right, then right. somehow they're in parallel. You know, they're kind of like uh, this is together. very much this is very much the the you know the um one of the central questions of stats is like what mm -hmm. is the modeling distribution? What is it? What is the underlying best probability model for this just you know for for this can we understand it in terms of a, a of a basic probability model you know and, and, and jumping and jumping ahead um, the whole uh, exciting thing you know why i'm interested in this is that uh, this idea of the generalized linear model and the idea of uh, natural exponential families with quadratic uh, uh quad quadratic uh, valued uh, variance quadratic variance functions is that uh, somehow those models uh, un under the right conditions when like they're exponential and the uh, variance is quadratic uh, with regard to the mean that um, you get this um, very um, stark choice in terms of which models will yeah. survive. No, I think it, I think it, you know, I think it's really important to understand your, the, the, Shepherd polynomials or orthogonal polynomials in that context. I think, you know, for what we're doing, mm -hmm. seems to me mm -hmm. a key idea. Okay, so it turns out here's the best estimate K is equal to what you do is you, you just simply mimic this formula with data hmm. and you know i think because it's sample um because we're taking sample data i believe it's one over n minus one i'm almost certain that's true <laughs> mm -hmm. that's fine with and and the reason is that you're using you're using um it's very interesting stas you know you're using this expression let's do the bottom first we don't know what the mean is so we have to use the data to oh. to estimate the mean
And when you use the data to estimate the mean, there's going to be less variability in that random variable mm -hmm. than there would be if you actually use the mean. Because if the data tends to be higher, if this data tends to be higher than it would, uh, you know, like a little bit higher in the mean, then, um, then you know, these XIs are also going to be higher. These are going to move together. And so you're going to get less squared. Well, there, there's um, there, the the variance is relative, not absolute. Is that the way to like because kind of you're relative, using a relative it's, mean? It's, a, rel so it's a relative variance, so you have to divide by n minus one to get a to to get a to get a true estimate of the variance. In other words, if you oh, it offsets you this, the it offsets. Yeah, if you did this a whole bunch of times, if you did this mm -hmm. you know this thing a whole bunch of times with a whole bunch of samples and computed this. And divided by n, it would it would it would it would be an underestimate of the variance. Yeah, oh, that's helpful. Yeah, so I mean, so it's almost like so it's like adding an extra point, so to speak. Uh, yeah, or, it's what's called or, there's there's only n minus one degrees of freedom. I mean, that's another way of thinking about it. Oh, okay, that's probably helpful okay. to think. Yeah. And so, um, and then you do the same thing. So notice that it is exactly a mimic of what we had on the bottom here we're just mm -hmm. we're just we're just estimating that in the most in the most obvious kind of way it turns out the most obvious way of estimating this mm -hmm. random variable um is is by this by this formula right here mm -hmm. um and the most obvious way of estimating this quantity right here is by what you might expect. You take um, x i star minus the mean, the sample mean, mm -hmm. and you take y i star minus its sample mean, mm hmm. hmm. And you just multiply them together and add. So that gives you a, this gives you a estimate and this is going to go as n goes to infinity to uh, sigma x, y over, but not only does it go as n goes to infinity, it is the best. See, that's, that's, you know, if you think about, if you think about what mm. we're doing here, there's a lot of ways of estimating this. For example, mm -hmm. we could use half the data points. We don't have to use all of them. Right. Why not just throw out half of them and, and estimate it? And the reason is that the variance in this, in, in this random variable here will be larger if we don't use all of them. Just like when we estimate the mean up here, um, if we don't use all the data points, you know, the variance is going to be, um, the variance is going to be larger and therefore there's going to be more variability in this quantity here. And therefore it's not going to be the, we wouldn't expect it. We wouldn't expect it to be, we expect it to be closer to the actual mean if we take more, more data because the variance in that random variable gotten by summing up these random variables in this way and divided by n is smaller than it would be if n is, if n wasn't as large is and, it possible to say like it's simple it's like the more points you have and you know especially if you use all the points it's tamer like it's it um, that's right okay now i'm going to check i want to check this formula because mm -hmm. again i'm and while you while you check that uh, i can say an idea that i had yeah. well you know we're talking about these two worlds uh and so these 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 cancel that cancels with that and you end oh, up okay. okay okay so um so and you know there's uh, there's various ways of understanding this um mm -hmm. there, there is a connection uh, let me just finish here um so where does this come from first of all why is this the best estimate and that's mm -hmm. where that's where i lack the depth you know why not some other combination like we, it's obvious that we should use all the data points. Otherwise, n is not going to be as large and our variance right. is going to be larger. But why not use some kind of a skewing, like some kind of a, 
oh, like, you know, the first data will get, you know, like we'll, we'll take n numbers that add up to one n positive numbers that add up to one and, and multiply each of these by alpha, you know, call those alpha. Right. You know, why not, why not some kind of a, a clever weighting of the... Or like, yeah, weigh the, weigh the points that are farther away, weigh them heavier, you know, or less, you know, either way. Like Right, you know, and, and so there's, there's, there's a lot that I don't understand. Like, why is this the best? Mm -hmm. Like, why is that of all combinations, algebraic combinations of these, of the sample data, why, you know, why is this the absolute best? And um, so uh, I don't really understand this well enough to, to be able to argue that. But what I, what I, where this formula comes from, let me just mm -hmm. briefly tell you where this comes from. That if you got some data, so we're going to plot our X's here and our Y's here. These are going to be our sample data. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, sample samples are going to look, you know, kind of maybe kind of all over the map. Um, but they're going to tend to cluster around mm -hmm. a central line. Mm -hmm. Does the line have to go through zero or not necessarily? I guess if the means are zero. Yeah, that... so I, yeah, I believe that the line is going to go through zero. Um, because of that restriction, right? That you well, choose to have the means or? Well, uh, oh, you're right, you're right. Um, That's the reason? Yeah, well, yeah, so no, I'm, 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 yeah. So in general, no. Okay, so it doesn't have to go through. It doesn't through have to, absolutely, absolutely not. If the means are not zero, yeah. Okay. You would expect it to go through zero. Um, I'm sorry, the means are, or the means are. Zero mean. Maybe just go back. If. And if this is equal to Kx plus some other, you know, B, if the expected value, it's basically. Otherwise. Otherwise. So have we been assuming that the um, that the uh, no, I mean, expected I, I, values are zero or not? Uh, no, I mean, like I, I wrote, uh, this assumes that the expected values are zero, but all you got to do is replace X by its expected value. I see. Okay. Yeah. And then you, you know. Okay. So, but, but if both minor, minor expected, modern, but just so I can ask again, if both expected values are zero for Y and for X, will then the line go through the origin? That is true. That is true. Okay, because it's as expected. I guess. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so it turns out that when you do this analysis, if you look at, uh, say, this is uh, y uh, i, this is x i y i, and you ask, what is the best fit line? Mm -hmm. Um. What it comes down to is you look at you look at a line um, where you call this the deviation, maybe the let's call this delta y i. Oh, in the y direction. I okay. de yeah, the i deviation. And it turns out what you want to do is you want to minimize the best fit in terms of, you know, what does best mean? It, it means in terms of minimizing, So it's what's called a maximum likelihood estimator, and I, I don't mm -hmm. quite, <laughs> I don't quite have a grip on on you know I can't I I can't describe it in a nutshell. But what you want to do is if the y i's these deviations the delta mm -hmm. y i's are Gaussian. Mm. 
and independent. I independently, independent and identically distributed Gaussian. Mm -hmm. And the best fit line, and again, best in terms of a certain criteria that's called maximum likelihood estimator. Mm -hmm. Minimum minimum y i star minus k x i star. Mm -hmm. That's the deviation. This is this is x i. Oh, and plus b. I should say. Mm -hmm. There's two parameters, K, X plus B. So this is K, on the line is K, X, I. Oh, that's the star. data. So K, X, I star plus B or minus B, whichever. But but it would be like what you get by plugging in X, I, the data point, X, I star. Right. What you would expect for that K. And then Y, I star is the actual value. And this is the deviation from of right. the actual and from the third. expected theoretical based on the data right. for X, I star. Right. Right. So this is, you're right. So that's the actual. And this is expected theoretical. Mm -hmm. Or this is on the line. This isn't quite like uh, least squares. Uh, or is this related to least this squares? Least or squares not? Yeah. So this is least this squares. Is least squares. I. E. Okay. In other words, find k and b to minimize this sum here oh i see minus you put in a square there i'm right. sorry i should have done that that's fine k x i star plus b squared mm -hmm. squared i equals one to n and you'll get k is equal to as above. And what is b equal to? B is probably the, um, I don't know, it's the average. Maybe b mm -hmm. is equal to, what's here? I mean, it's probably just the average. La, 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 la. La, 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 la. Afterwards, John sent me a correction of, to this formula for B, where he's inserting um, K X sub I uh, star alongside the Y sub I star. I, I appreciate your um, teaching me uh, for many yeah. reasons, but... Uh, it's really yeah, it's, helpful, like your intuition, uh, just the person you are, lets you focus in on the things that are like uh, essential, you know, from my point of view, or like in the big picture point of view. And so like, I've been starting to watch uh, videos on statistics, etc. But um, the people, you know, they know their subjects, but it's very flat in terms of intuition a lot of times. You know, it's very hard to see. Well, like in, in, in the intuition that they give would be more in terms of, well, how do you apply this? It's not about like, why does yeah. this exist this way? You know, so right, right, these right. existential questions are coming out. Uh, and so one of the big existential questions uh, that's relevant for me is uh, the whole notion of the quadratic. Like uh, you're saying the best fit, you know, is... Uh, coming from this quadratic relationship. And so we know that like the orthogonality relations are quadratic and they're driving, you know, uh, they're driving this uh, whole uh, Sheffer polynomial classification. They're driving this uh, generalized linear model, um, this whole quadratic uh, restriction. And so that's just uh, helpful to, and I was, you know, when I was uh, studying statistical things in college, I saw that like, yeah, this quadratic's a big thing. And like, where is it coming from? And no one ever really quite was able to explain it, um, you know, to, to, to where it would click mean, with me. Now, are you talking about least squares quadratic or? 
Um, I think I think I think that basically what it seems is that like the least square quadratic is the same quad. I mean, it's this essential quadratic here, right? I mean, like like it's uh, that's basic. There's there's not another quadratic. It's the quadratic to worry. You know that. Uh, yeah, and and you know where where we're missing where where we're sort of. Uh, what what's disturbing to me is I'm not able to give you the probabilistic mm -hmm. um, the probabilistic reason why we call this the best fit. You know, there's a probabilistic. Right. And, we can and, yeah uh, we'll look into that. And so so we should look into that. I, and that's that's the one piece that I was missing. I I didn't, I didn't I had limited time to look at this. It, you know, I maybe spent I don't know part of an no, hour. Yeah, this is great. And so of, you know, you know the, the heart it, of it these squares. It wasn't enough for me to. It wasn't enough for me that's to fine. understand like so, what I mean. I think we could probably, you know, we, we from here, I, I don't think it's that hard to figure out why we would call this the best fit if you have the mean minimum yeah. least, you know, the minimum. So just a couple a couple more, more a couple more points I want to make is one uh, that uh, the whole point of the least fit quadratic nature is that like the points, the bad points uh, are the ones that are uh, uh, having more influence. Uh, and uh, and I guess what that says it's a very yes. important not to erase data points because you oh, know, yeah. oh, because yeah. like as soon as you start erasing data points you're erasing the people who should have the most say at the table you know oh yeah so that's very uh, that's very uh, bad uh, um, then another uh, idea that came up um, I wanted to say was like when you have these two types of worlds uh, and if you think of uh, a world as a category like in category theory. Uh, so what this seems to be setting up, uh, I'm guessing, is an adjunction, you know, where like uh, you have one functor that's taking you from the theory to the uh, practice. And that's probably like kind of like a, a trivial thing. It's just saying like, well, you know, we expect these values, let's say. We, ex we expect this model to look at And then you go backwards. Uh, from the data, you go to the theory and you're kind of uh, constructing, you know, you have this kind of algorithm construction that uh, constructs things that should uh, hopefully um, mirror the theory. And so you can go back and forth and you won't end up, they're not inverses, but they're, um, they're very much uh, in sync with each other. They're, there's like a synchronization of those two worlds. That's what an adjunction does. So, um, that's that, so that's helpful to know that like uh, in the world of orthogonal polynomials, you know, when you look at uh, distributions, you may end up coming up with an adjunction, but that adjunction, yeah. Yeah. that adjunction will presume that there is a um, real world, you know, like, or presume that there's an empirical world, uh, which is very interesting in terms of issues of randomness and probability, because that's what randomness always seems strange, like randomness is a weird thing where you can't ever just plug it in you know you can't know like you don't have a way you don't have handles on it but what this is exactly modeling is that situation where you don't have handles on things uh, they're just um but they may exist let's say and then they are interacting you're interacting with things that don't have handles well uh, you know there is there there are mathematical mo models of randomness for example mm -hmm. ergodic theory is is such a model where you mm -hmm. you actually uh, you model the underlying dynamical system off of the unitary dynamics, uh, mm -hmm. certain, certain ergodic theorems, uh, uh, like for example, the mean ergodic theorem would, would, would assume a unitary dynamics underlying the dynamical system. And this is like a, you know, this happens with like classical systems or under, you know, there's underpinned by a unitary dynamics and um, same thing with quantum. And, and then what, what you do is you prove if you can, and it's very mm -hmm. difficult to do it. Like, like as I, as far as I know it, you know, only very limited um, uh, dynamical systems so far have been been amenable to the proof of ergodicity. And ergodicity says that um, that that um, Oh crap! It it says that. Oh, I know the conclusion of the ergodic theorem. I forgot what the assumptions are now. Um, <laughs> you'll have to look it up. It, it's uh, so maybe next time I'll 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 yeah. But this is a good thing. For but, us what, to but basically, look, but basically the conclusion of the ergodic theorem is that the time averages of mm -hmm. of a dynamical system 
will equal the ensemble averages if you take the time averages so what it's saying is that the empirical world of taking averages will match up theoretical world which is the the you know averages over phase space uh the mm -hmm. the the ensemble average and so it justifies empirical statistics it, it justifies saying oh well we can treat this like a like it basically justifies statistical mechanics mm -hmm. unfortunately it's very difficult to prove that 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 real systems are ergodic i think that i think mm -hmm. like um idealized pool uh, uh two-dimensional uh balls on a on a on a frictionless uh like pool table mm -hmm. uh you know like hitting each other and hitting the sides and stuff mm -hmm. that's been pro that's been proven to be ergodic I don't know if three-dimensional has been. That would be a big breakthrough in ergodic theory. I don't. I, it, this, when I was a grad student, it had not yet been proven. Um, so, like molecules in space. Let's yeah. Say, so it tells you. It, right? it tells you how difficult those underlying assumptions are to prove. And but you know when ergodic theory was first developed, it was like uh, people like von Neumann were involved in it. Mm -hmm. They were so excited because you know it all of a sudden proved you know like like justified statistical mechanics. Mm -hmm. and um you know like why is it okay not to actually look at the underlying dynamics we can just look at things like the uh things like the partition function and and look at things mm -hmm. probabilistically like why you know why why isn't the particular dynamics of of the underlying molecular system or whatever important and it would be ah it's ergodic yeah that's it we're we're just you know our time averages are 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 averages that we measure in the laboratory are going to be equal to the ensemble averages the things we calculate with a partition function so that would justify mm -hmm. all statistical mechanics and you know because that was a big that was a big uh so know, let, let me just so i yeah. don't quite so like you can look at things you can look at phenomena from the point of view of how they're evolving over time and like if you're taking repeated measurements let's say right right and you can also uh try to say, well, what, it, what would it look like if we captured a snapshot, you know, of, of uh, at a certain time, you know, of the whole system, right? Well, no, Maybe not necessarily. A not snapshot would just be one measurement. Uh, no, what it is is underlying it with, pro, you know, like the underlying probability model for, mm -hmm. like, for example, the model that uses statistical mechanics, you never, I mean, time in statistical mechanics disappears, right? Because you assume that everything goes along ensemble averages. You write down a partition function mm -hmm. that gives you, you know, probably, you know, gives you the number of states with a certain en energy and all that kind of stuff. You get this, uh, uh, you get this density of states thing, which is basically a probabilistic model for, and then you, then you assume maximum entropy and, uh, then you get, well, the maximum entropy is what gives you your, 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 Probably underlying probabilistic model, but then you start computing only with a probabilistic model, not with a time model. Time disappears. Why mm -hmm. is it okay for time to disappear? You know, and the the, mm -hmm. the the reason is that if the if you have ergodicity, you can replace your time averages, which are what you're going to measure in a laboratory, with mm -hmm. your ensemble averages, which is what you're doing on paper with statistical mechanics. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a beautiful, you know, it, it's sort of like, you know. It, it you know statistical mechanics at that point was maybe 30 years old maybe slightly older and mm -hmm. you know, physicists I mean, that was what i was trying to say like with this idea of the snapshot that not not it's not like the snapshot is well that you if you could um if you could look at things um you know different parts of the system and make your you know different possibilities and measure them all uh but that's not very that's not how measurement works i guess in principle right like but that's well, what you want. That's the answer that you want to get. I mean, you know, measurements. I think I think you can like you can put thermometers in different parts of a system. You know, you can have right. you know, like you can you can do so what's the difference between again between the time and, and ensemble? So the time averages of a of a dynamical system would be sort of the things that you can measure in a laboratory. In other words, you take snapshots mm -hmm. of the system, like the temperature of the system or the pressure or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, and then you want to say that, you know, if you average these over time, these will, you know, obey a probabilistic model. 
and the underlying probabilistic model would be like uh you know come from like a density of states analysis not a dynamical analysis but like mm -hmm. how many states are consistent with this energy and then you know oh, what, okay so it's not like it's not like uh, it's not like uh you know step i leads to step i plus one leads right, to step right. plus right. Two you're, analysis you're, you're, it's you're saying north. that uh, you don't need to think dynamically you can just look uh st as you were saying statistically that's right yes. it, and it, that'll it, and that'll explain the fluctu any fluctuations yeah, and it explains it explains why it's okay to use statistical statistical mechanics. You know why you can replace mechanics. With well, and so it's it's saying like that you can. It's basically saying like instead of a deterministic walk, you can think in terms of like a random walk. Right. right. Like, exactly. Exactly. And so it's kind of interesting. See, so and then that notion of randomness is kind of like uh, back interpreted. You know, it's kind of and see that's maybe what I'm trying to say. My hunch is with the uh, a junction setup would be like. What the adjunction setup could do, and basically maybe what's happening in, th in that case of the ergodicity theorem, you know, is like you're not starting with randomness, but you're ending with randomness. You're saying, hey, like because we're able to uh, use probabilistic, you know, methods and getting a, a suitable model like that allows us to uh, pretend that random walks were taking place, then we can, con you know, we can end up with this notion of randomness, you know, that these walks are happening randomly, right? Like, even though we have, we don't actually have any evidence for random walks, it's all, it's all, uh, uh, that's a conclusion you draw at the end, that, that, that randomness would work, you know? Yeah. But you never observe randomness, you just, uh, you just collect evidence that randomness would be a fine uh, explanation. Right. And so but and that's what i'm trying it, to say like the adjunction is doing it's kind of like the adjunction is gathering evidence for uh you know that by showing the constraints on you know one side on the other and the other side and the other side saying that there's this whole hierarchy of constraints that lets you ground the notion of randomness that's saying well ran you know randomness is a concept that uh you know it's like a ghost that you that may exist you know Although you never see it, you know you can never prove it, but um, but uh, you you show that uh, it's it smells like a ghost, you know, looks like a ghost, behaves like a ghost. It maybe there is a ghost. So well, you know, there's the, and and ultimately there's got to be some justification for replacing uh, a detailed dynamical model with a with a statistical model, and and, you know, and I think that just the justification must be kind of like we're like you're able to make the constraints tighter and tighter and tighter, you know, to your satisfaction, you know, because like to say like, well, um, that, it, you know, it, that, that it works, you know, like that the fluctuations, the behavior of the fluctuations are satisfied by, you know, a, a good model and a better model and even a better model than that, you know, that they, uh, you know, and so in theory, you know, in the limit, there's a best model and the best model would be equivalent to randomness uh, if, if there could be such a thing. Yeah. So, you know, I have to go, but I just want to point okay. out, you know, there's mm -hmm. an easy part of this. Mm -hmm. Let me show you the easy part. And then I had one more last question. And okay, cool. what's the easy part? Going from this to this is easy. Just okay. take, you know, all you do is, you know, com compute, a, compute the critical point. Mm -hmm. In other words, take the derivative with respect to K and the derivative with respect to B. Mm -hmm. In other words, just do a minimization. It's a two-parameter minimization. Okay. So if you want to entertain yourself, you can do that. The hard part is this. Okay, we, we may return to this. Why best? Okay, and that's... Uh, so let me, let me try to, let me try to, um, answer that, you know, um, and then, and then you know, I, the interesting is getting Shu Hong's take on this, you know, because oh, he, okay. you know, he, I'm sure, you know, like all this, you know, like he would probably approach it from a different point of view. You know, I'm approaching it from the point of view of a, of probability theory and mm -hmm. that's my wheelhouse because that's mathematics. Mm -hmm. there, there's probably some insights if you think about it just purely in terms of data or the way he thinks about it uh that that 
are corollaries of this, but you wouldn't think of to begin with, you know. Yeah, that would that's a great idea. Uh, because reach probably, out to him. I appreciate that. There's there's probably some there's probably some very cool ways of understanding this this right here mm -hmm. um without thinking about joint probability distributions or anything, you know, and I'm just guessing. And anyway, you can imagine. Uh, and then, then my last question or point was about the K. Like, so the whole point of this kind of was the K, I think. And the idea was that, uh, so theoretically, like K relates uh, the sigma X, Y. Like, so I think basically, like, this is my understanding, and you can correct me. But uh, it, it, theoretically, it's straightforward to have the sigma X, and it's straightforward to have the sigma Y. That's kind of like, you know, it's assumed that you can do that. But the whole question is like, well, how do they depend on each other if they do? And then so this whole notion of the sigma xy. And so theoretically, k is saying that you can calculate the sigma, k, you know, if you have the k, you can calculate the sigma xy. So the question is, is, you know, uh, supposing you just have the data, can you get that k? And then that would give you the covariance matrix. And then you would know oh, like, yeah. exactly the relationship. This is the whole point. Is Without that right? A doubt. Like what we're doing? Without a doubt. K, k is an estimator. Okay. Yeah. K, K, you know, the, the, the formula is an estimator of that. In other words, as N goes infinity, it will converge to this and it, and it, and it will converge to yeah. a smaller and smaller variance, you know? Um, and, but what I, what I don't know is why some other wacko uh, formula that maybe is right. more complicated than this isn't even better. And it could be that in certain contexts, probably Gaussian, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, my guess is a Ga if the underlying distribution is Gaussian, this absolutely, you can't do any better than this. Finally, a conversation where John and I are talking about uh, ideas, the cognitive frameworks of wondrous wisdom, um, mathematical perspective on linear regression, how it relates to game theory and uh, randomness and morality. As John was teaching me about the covariance matrix, I pictured it uh, being um, not just two by two, but larger, uh, which means that there would be several input uh, variables, uh, x sub one, x sub two, all the way up to x sub k. And uh, that's called a uh, multiple linear regression. And the more I thought about it, I realized that uh, that reminds me of the cognitive framework one all many, which will be familiar to you if you watch the introduction to math for wisdom. So here, um, there's a distinguished uh, variable, um, and it's uh, singled out by um, well, the variable is y, but it's singled out with this coefficient b sub naught, which is basically uh, 1. Um, and um, that is the single output, but there could be lots of input variables. So each of these b sub i's can be thought of as uh, exhibiting the many. And all of these are uh, coming out of this constant, uh, I'll call it c, but... Um, other, other way, otherwise, it could be called um, uh, the B, the uh, y-intercept. But so the idea is that uh, uh, these three types of uh, constants are all fit together in this uh, equation by which uh, we have uh, all of these different uh, inputs contributing into a single output. So... Uh, that's a cognitive framework to uh, think about, and it uh, expresses, uh, it's a conception of the learning cycle, where we take a stand, follow through, reflect, and so on. And here, uh, that could also be uh, imagined in the sense that you have a single out output, and then that output could be an input to a subsequent uh, cycle, uh, and so you can keep uh, perfecting your uh, evaluation towards some why that you're trying to uh, evaluate. So I guess my question, and I, I don't understand this deeply enough, is that if you if you um, practice this regression game, mm -hmm. and which we do, that in some sense 
does it give you optimality? Um, like, for example, we're going to use that regression line that comes from linear regression to make predictions. Mm -hmm. And imagine some kind of a game set up where, you know, if you, um, you know, if you make uh, correct predictions, you get a reward. If you make uh, incorrect predictions, you get, you get um, penalized. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then you have different teams kind of playing this game. And one team is playing with a linear regression model. The other is playing with a different model and so forth. And the question is, over all possible teams, does the linear regression team win? In other words, from a sort of a game point of view, mm -hmm. is it really in some kind of cosmic sense the best you can do? Uh, and I think that answer, I, I think the answer is yes. I have a feeling the answer is yes. And that's that's the thing is I don't I don't know the proof of that, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so if I had a deeper knowledge of statistics, I'd be able to tell you. But that'd be that'd be interesting to look into. In other words, is it the best we can do? You know, in terms of in terms of playing a game where you know you're trying to make the best, you're you're trying to make correct predictions. And, and so. So what this language of wondrous wisdom is uh, offering, if we can, you know, understand it and, and, and uh, uncover it and apply it, but it's saying, hey, like uh, the way that would be investigated, you know, or in this framework is to say, look, this is a particular issue uh, with uh, four levels for the sake of knowledge. So just for knowledge to exist, you know, you need to have these types of four uh, domains, you know, and this kind of going back and forth between the, 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 the worlds. But when you ask that type of question like you're doing, you're kind of, it's like a meta question. You know, you're moving to the meta level in a certain sense. And that meta level, you can get there either by adding one perspective or two perspectives or three perspectives, depending on um, how how much awareness you're adding to the issue. But for example, if you were to, if we were to add one perspective, we would have five perspectives. And that's the kind of structure for decision making. So we'd shift from knowledge to decision making. And decision making uh, requires five perspectives. It basically says that, well, like every effect has had its cause looking backward, but uh, not every cause has had its effects looking forward. And so there's a critical point for deciding, you know? And so um, that would um, all be spelled out by uh, these orthogonal Sheffer polynomials, that type of classification, or in probability and statistics, there's the natural exponential families with, uh, quadratic uh, variance function. And so there would be like five different ways of looking at the type of problem that you're saying, you know, basically. Now, if we add a two perspectives, we would get like six things. And in that case, um, I think there's a sixth family of orthogonal polynomials, which is the Krafchuk polynomials. And what the Krafchuk polynomials, uh, it's kind of funky because, you know, there's five, but then there's six. And why is there six? The Krafchuk polynomials satisfy the same deal as these other ones, but they're not an infinite sequence, they're a finite sequence. So um, it's kind of like when you model uh, the binomial situation, you can model it like with an infinite uh, family, but you could also model it with a finite family uh, where then it just goes to zero at a certain point. Uh, so depending on how you want to look at these things or not, but that will get included or not. And so the idea is that uh, this division of everything, the six per sexes is like for morality. So like if it was on the moral level, then, then there would be another way of looking at it. And then that type of thing would become, and then for a logical system, you need seven perspectives. So that'd be like a higher middle level. So the idea is that this type of question that you're asking, depending on what you mean by optimizing on, you know, on what level of awareness you're dealing with, you would be dealing with one of those, you know, either the five some or the six some or the seven some. So that's how this, um, that's the framework I'm trying to show is behind all this uh, mm. mathematical activity. Yeah. And that may sound like science fiction. But well, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's, um, 
I mean, it would be certainly nice to understand the stuff at a higher level, you know. Um, I, yeah, I believe, I believe, yeah. like books on game theory do address things, things like this. You know, I think mm -hmm. that there, there is a game theory perspective on all this stuff, and I think it goes, it goes way back to the foundations of game theory. Um, and uh, but there's, but there's like game theory, which where you can just be simply optimizing in a certain way, and then there's game theory where like a level of morality creeps in. You know, we're like you're you're starting right, to right. No, you know, no, so think, that's why that's, that's why this would make that distinction. It definitely it definitely depends on what game you're trying to optimize. Yeah. And my guess, my guess is that under some reasonable um under under some reasonable um assumptions about the game, uh some kind of garden variety assumptions about the game that linear regression is the best you can do. Um and that might be the ultimate that might be the ultimate framework for understanding why it's it's a uh it's optimal in, in a sense you know on the other hand yeah if you want to creep other if you want to uh have other stuff come in like for example penalize really bad predictions more um you know if that if that's for example if there's some catastrophic reason for penalizing you know for for having you know like occasionally some very bad predictions uh that would probably result in a completely different uh well, I'll, I'll give an, than the least squares you know well i'll give an yeah i'll give an example um that's very practical is that uh, we had a referendum a few years ago on whether or not to have a nuclear power station in lithuania okay because in the soviet days the soviets built the largest nuclear power station in the world in national park in lithuania <laughs> Uh, and it was, uh, and so the question is like, well, okay, still, you know, there's is a plus. Is, is it still there? Well, so when we joined the European Union, I think, you know, Sweden is not that far from Lithuania and, you know, they don't want a nuclear disaster in Lithuania. So uh, we committed to shutting it down, at least part of it, let's see. But then I think people voted to shut down the whole thing. But the argument that I would use, because I was in favor of shutting it down, um, although you know the electricity was very cheap and it maybe would come in handy, but it's an averaging argument, you see. So when you have, a, or it's actually an argument about averaging, when is it appropriate to average? So for example, when you have a big country like you know Siberia or Canada, if you have uh, nuclear reactors, and of course, uh, hopefully they're safe, but you know every so often it's possible to have a, disaster like Chernobyl. But the deal is, is that, well, you can average, you know, like, I mean, Canada is huge and, you know, okay, so part of Canada is not inhabitable anymore. So, you know, that's okay. I mean, you fence it off. But see, in a country like Lithuania, it's a small country, like, you know, it's all or nothing. You see, so it's just a very different calculus. It's a different There's game. nothing to average. You can't average when you're in an all or nothing situation. Yeah. Gotcha. Right? Yeah. See, so that's an example where, like, it's nothing to do with optimization. It's about uh, like a moral understanding. Like, what is the problem? You know, it's like it so, would be so, immoral. To so my guess that. is that uh, my guess is that something like a least squares or statistical um, analysis is a completely different game in Lithuania than it would be in Canada. Well, I think I mean, maybe it's, it's just the, even, it's an inappropriate game. Like, so something that is um, so like Canada. I guess the. Solving the problem in Canada doesn't have the moral dimension that it does in Lithuania, because in Canada, it's not all or nothing, so you can average, you see. Whereas in Lithuania, it is all or nothing. Like, if it goes wrong, we don't have any more Lithuanian, basically, right? I mean, that's maybe, you know, but basically you can say, like, that's, an, that, so you can't average things like that. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain sense, like, you know, certain kinds of nuclear war, you know, certain kinds of climate crisis, you know, you just can't average them into your, into your uh, financial statement, right? Like, average is not the appropriate model, uh, not because it's not accurate, just because it's just not the right way to think, you know, it's just, you can't think that way, you have to think differently. Um, so, see, and that's morality. See, morality, that's why utilitarianism isn't moral in a certain sense. You know, just utilitarianism runs in, you know, the, the, the greatest happiness for the majority of the people is just not right. a moral system. It doesn't right. work. So, it, and this, is where, this is where it comes up. So, I don't know how that actually works in the modeling, but that would be, this is an example of the kind of thing that would crop up in that.
in conclusion, one idea that came uh, thinking about linear regression and how it relates an input X and an output Y and thinking about what that could mean in the generalized linear model. I thought uh, of the five sum as uh, relating uh, different interpretations of uh, X and Y where X can be the cause, it can have, uh, there can be an effect Y of the cause X, and uh, also there can be simply an effect Y, and there can be a cause X of effect Y. And the decision point, uh, which in physics might not be the bound state, uh, could be when you can uh, flip X and Y when around so it becomes ambiguous you know which is the cause which is the effect or which is the input which is the output so that's an idea and um, that's the kind of idea I'm looking for uh, by exploring math with math for wisdom um, and so uh, I want to thank you John this is a beautiful um, exposition of your you know in, insight and knowledge and I just uh, want to end like with a prayer to say like a Thank God for people like you and then thank God for people like Shu Hong and other people out there who um, have their own take on this type of thing. And what a beautiful thing it would be to learn from just like I'm, it's beautiful to learn from you just to have that intuition available. So thank you. Yeah. OK. Yeah, it's been fun. My great thanks to John Harlan for uh, tutoring me, teaching me and conversing with me about linear regression. And if you know some thing about linear regression that we should know about. Please contact us, leave comments, suggest uh, experts, and uh, participate in our community. Like this video, subscribe, support me through Patreon. I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom.